So what did you think of listening to the Baroque and the classical pieces of music from the last lecture? I hope you were able to enjoy some of them and think about how they sounded different from each other. Society changed so many aspects of music in these 70 years. We're going to talk now about the specific characteristics, why they changed, how they changed specifically, and then, once you know these characteristics, we'll go on to the next lecture and talk about the forms that these characteristics help to create. That's when we'll do a little bit more listening so that you can hear how the characteristics of classical music really sound. So, what did composers change in regards to music from the Baroque to the classical? There are a few major changes that were very important to know about before we talk about the actual elements of music that changed. The first is that composers in the classical era had access to newer instruments. It basically meant that there was a more quote-unquote usable orchestra available for them. String instruments had been better defined and were more stable. They had all been made now in specific forms and there was no fluctuation in quality of the instruments as there was in the Baroque. Woodwind instruments and brass were also being made more commonly and they were made by, from better materials. They were redesigned to produce louder, more clear sounds. This led to composers having the ability to really concentrate on the use of tone color for all of these instruments in a solo and ensemble setting. One of the biggest changes was the development of the piano. Before this, you know that the Baroque used something called the harpsichord. It was the most popular keyboard instrument, especially because of the basso continuo. But the harpsichord could not produce dynamics and was very, very limited in tone color. The piano had more keys, better tone color, and could produce dynamics. And they had created small versions of the piano. These small versions were not too expensive, and they fit in the home. So for amateur musicians, the middle class, who were looking for instruments to have available to them, the piano was a very ideal instrument. So instruments such as the piano became super popular. They were everywhere, and all people wanted music for the piano, not for the harpsichord. It was very much due to these new instruments and the sounds they could create the composers were able to expand on the ideas of the Baroque. In the newer orchestra that developed, you had the usual strings, you had woodwinds, as you sometimes did in the Baroque, you also had a brass section, which by the end of the classical period was a full brass section including trumpets, trombones, French horns, you had a percussion section as well. In this case, it was only timpani, but in almost every piece of classical music written for the newer orchestra, you actually had percussion. In the Baroque, you did not. And again, this new orchestra was developed because there were new instruments to be used. There were larger numbers of players able to play these instruments at a high level. So the new orchestra not only had a higher number of players, but it always had woodwinds in pairs, a full brass section by the later classical period, timpani. The one thing it did not have was basso continuo. The basso continuo went out of style, and so it was no longer used. One of the most important things about this new idea of the orchestra was that every instrument was treated as an individual sound producing instrument. So there was a lot more emphasis on tone color rather than simply on ensemble playing behind soloists. As stated before, the piano was one of the things that really changed music for the better in the classical period. The piano was invented around 1700 still during the Baroque but it wasn't widely used until 1775. This was be true because it wasn't until around 1775 that the middle class was fully established and that the instrument itself was established and stable enough to really be used well. And the middle class, once they had heard this instrument, really was keen to have these instruments in their home. You can see the pictures below. The first is a harpsichord. You can see it has two keyboards and only one pedal. 
which meant that it really didn't have much control over its sound. The middle picture with the gray background is the first type of piano. It was still made out of wood, but it had gone to one keyboard, three pedals, and had much more control because it was attached to different kinds of hammers and strings that created better tone and more dynamics. Today, we actually make pianos out of a lot of different materials, and this is the most typical one that you see below. I'm sure you can all recognize it as a baby grand piano. Most classical music, especially in the later period, was written for piano and not harpsichord, because by this time, the piano was the most common instrument, it was in homes across Europe, and it was what many of the composers studied themselves and performed on in concert settings. It was in the classical period that the piano became one of the most beloved instruments, and it's still used by most pop genres today. You see pop artists sit down behind a keyboard and play, whether it's an electronic keyboard or an actual acoustic piano. They're still using these pianos because people love the sound and the tone colors that it produces. So these instruments made it possible for classical music to sound new and different. But the elements of music also changed during the classical period because of the new audience base of the middle class, the rise of the amateur musician, and the loss of power of the aristocracy, the church, and the patronage system. All of these things, the enlightenment, the revolutions that were happening, all of them, created new ways to use the elements music because the audience demanded new sounds. The characteristics we're going to talk about particularly are contrast, mood, how rhythm was used, how texture, melody, and dynamics were used, and the end of the basso continuo. The first and most important element of music in the classical is the idea of contrast of mood. Remember that in the Baroque, we talked very often about unity of mood, especially within movements of music. In the classical, this concept changes completely. Audiences and composers wanted lots of variety and contrast, not only within pieces, but within movements, sometimes even within melodies themselves. These moods could be changed suddenly or gradually. Remember that most of the time, the moods and the dynamics in the Baroque were changed very, very suddenly. They didn't really have the capability on the instruments to create gradual changes in contrast, in melody, in dynamic. But now, with better instruments, and the piano in particular, changes in mood, contrast of mood, could be created more gradually. This meant that composers could fluctuate freely between moods when they were writing. And that music became more emotional. You hear this contrast in lots of different ways in regards to rhythm, melody, harmony, texture, and all the rest of the basic elements, but it's one of the most important things to listen for. Remember back to Beethoven's Violin Concerto or to the Don Giovanni catalog aria? Did you hear unity of mood? Did the characters always sound exactly the same when they were singing in the opera? Or did the violin always be playing the same dynamics and the same ideas and the same rhythms repeated over and over again? Or was there more contrast of mood? Was there more emotion and freedom? I think there was. And if you go back and listen to it again, once you've talked about all of these characteristics with me, I think you'll hear those differences a lot more. Rhythm was much more flexible in the classical period than in the Baroque. They still used rhythmic patterns, but they used a lot more patterns in each movement, in each piece of music. And there was really no emphasis on this repetition of pattern just because of unity. They instead wanted to be unpredictable. They wanted unexpected pauses. They used a lot of syncopation and accents. They changed the lengths of the tones that they were using very unpredictably. So while patterning of rhythm was still used occasionally, the unpredictability of pattern usage in rhythm was what was really iconic of the era. And again, these changes were sudden sometimes, or gradual at other times. This is not to say that all music was complicated rhythmically. They did try to create 
a sense of wholeness to their music, a sense of balance in how they use the patterns. They always structured their rhythm very, very precisely, but they moved freely from one rhythmic section or idea to the next. Remember that classical music is about balance and structure. So whatever contrast of mood they used, whatever contrast in rhythms they used, they still tried to create an overall sense of balance in their music. Texture is actually kind of controversial in this period. The book states that the texture of the classical period was basically homophonic. As a musician who plays a lot of classical music, I tend to disagree with this statement. The book's perspective is true in a sense that the classical period has moved away from polyphony and complexity in music. So they consider most of the music of the period to be homophonic. However, it doesn't stay homophonic, which is why I think that this is kind of a false statement. Most classical music uses all the different textures, monophony, homophony, and polyphony. These textures are used gradually or suddenly, changing between movements in movements themselves. Composers loved using all three of the textures, especially Beethoven. The book, when it talks about basically homophonic music, is talking about the earliest of classical music, especially pre-classical music. That music tended to be mostly homophonic with areas of homo uh, monophony and polyphony. As the period progressed, the middle class rose, more amateur musicians were gaining ability, and the concert hall was becoming more and more popular, as well as performing musicians being able to financially support themselves outside the patronage system. That's when all of the textures began to be used again. And composers used them freely, just as they did rhythm, and just as they did melodies. The thing about classical melodies that's best to remember is that they were tuneful and easy to hear. Many of them are folksy or popular in style. Just as in the Baroque, composers sometimes borrowed folk tunes to write their music on. They loved borrowing popular tunes or writing their own new popular tunes because they wanted people to have a sense of balance in their music. They wanted them to have something to sing, to remember when they left the concert hall or when they were playing at home. They really wanted audiences, the middle class and aristocracy, both, to remember their melodies and always be singing them so that they liked the, that music and so that the audiences would buy more of the composer's music. But melodies, even though they were balanced and symmetrical, they would have two phrases that were put together into one full idea, which again produced balance and symmetry. And even though they always sounded like a complete idea, unlike a lot of the melodies of the Baroque, the melody could really sound like whatever the composer really wanted it to. They knew what audiences wanted, and they tended to compose melodies that sounded like what, what was popular. But as the period progressed, melodies again kept changing and fluctuating. Their length would change, the tone color, the dynamic usage, the actual phrase structures. Everything was fluid in this period. But what was most common were these tuneful, easy to remember melodies. One of the most drastic differences between the Baroque and the classical was in relationship to the dynamics. The piano and the new orchestra with better instruments really changed how dynamics were viewed. Audience wanted so much more of them. They didn't want the sudden dynamics that were the only option in Baroque music. Instead, they wanted gradual dynamics, such as the crescendo and decrescendo. They still used sudden dynamics for excitement and drama, but that drama was really emphasized and made more exciting when they would use gradual increases and decreases in dynamics. These new gradual dynamics really gave shape to the melodies that were being produced and made them more tuneful and easier to sing. The use of gradual dynamics also helped to better portray emotions and the shades of emotions. Different degrees of emotions could finally be brought into music rather than just the happy or sad sounds of the Baroque. 
Remember that in the Baroque, they had to inflect notes in different ways. They had to use tones in particular ways in order to create emotion because they really couldn't create emotion using dynamics or tone color. Now, they finally could portray these different shades of emotions and tell better stories with their music. Finally, the last thing you need to realize is that the classical era saw the end of the basso continuo. This happened for a few reasons. Mostly because composers did not want to give performers the freedom to improvise. And most, compos or most composers wanted their music to sound a particular way. They wanted to write out all the notes to the music. And remember that in Basso Continuo, they used this concept called figured bass, a system of numbers written below a score that were filled in in particular ways by performers. Since composers wanted the control over their sound of music and wanted to create not only beautiful melodies, but beautiful harmonies that sounded a specific way, they stopped using the basso continuo. In this period, most performers, because so many of them were amateur musicians, also needed easier music to play and did not know how to read figured bass anymore. Basso, con but basso continuo lines became thought of as too complex and they became unnecessary to the new style of the music. So by the middle of the period, basso continuo was no longer used. So what do you listen for overall when listening to classical music? You listen for more contrast and unpredictability. You listen for moments of excitement, flashy differences in mood, emotion, tone color. One of the things we didn't really address in talking about the characteristics was the element tone color because it relates to every single one of the elements. It's something that's an overarching difference of the period. Tone color is different because all the instruments are capable of producing new and better tone colors that create emotion, that can create new phrases and new musical ideas. Keep that in mind when you're listening to the different contrast and unpredictability in all of these classical pieces of music. But the most important thing to realize is that even though there was all of this contrast and unpredictability, the music really yearned for and gave listeners this sense of prettiness, of simplicity, of beauty and emotion and telling a story. Composers used the ideas of contrast and unpredictability to actually create more simplistic music when it came to the actual melody lines. That gave all the music a sense of balance. And that was so important for people. They wanted music that was exciting and flashy and new and beautiful, that changed mood, changed tone colors, changed in dynamic schemes. But they still wanted music that sounded balanced, that gave them a sense of completion, of satisfaction when they listened to it. And this sense of balance was really brought to the forefront in the new forms of music created during this period. Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, the three greatest composers of this time, were simply incredible at writing in these new forms they developed over the 70-year period. These new forms were the new popular style of the time. Now that you know how the specific elements could be used during this period, feel free to go back and listen to those Baroque and Classical examples 1 through 4 again so that you really hear how contrast is used in these movements. And while you're thinking about how all of those different things, contrast, mood, the melodies, the rhythms, the harmonies are used, think as well about this sense of completion, of telling a story, the sense of balance, See whether you can pick out how composers were able to create balance even while they used these contrasting ideas. The next lecture is all about these new forms that were really emphasizing balance in the music as well as these contrasting new elements in music. So 
once you've gone back and listened to those examples again to get a better idea of what classical music really sounds like in regards to these el characteristic elements, move on to the third lecture of this unit and discuss with me the forms. Learn about those forms. We'll have more listening examples that particularly go through those forms. I hope you enjoy the music and now move on to lecture three.